Hello, I am Jesus Labarta, and I'm going to explain today uh, the mechanisms used by Paraver to build the semantic functions of time that it then displays and let us analyze the performance of parallel applications. And I will do it, I will be now loading a Paraver trace file and a configuration file that will pop up certain views. The trace is being loaded and the configuration files are going to be loaded but we get a warning that some there is some of the views that will be loaded the information they require is not available in the trace okay this is a warning let us let us continue and we see that some of these files do have the information and we see something in reality in this case is l2 misses per thousand instructions which has not the the the, the information on l2 cache misses so in this situation, if one was very interested on this specific metrics, one would have to really obtain the trace, see how to set up a stride to obtain use actually this hardware counter. And this you can see in the documentation and other uh, videos of this series. Let me, I, we don't have that information, let's forget about it. And the, the idea would be to show how for these other many different views that we generate, how they are generated. And I will be looking to start with at this one, for example, which is L3 misses per thousand instructions. This is a metric. This is a timeline which actually you see here. It's actually the division of two other metrics. This is the division of L3 misses divided by instructions. So you have a semantic functions here, one per thread that in, indicate how many L3 have been misses have been done in a given interval. This other one specifies for every interval, the same intervals, because all hardware counters are read exactly at the same point in time, how many instructions have been done. The division between those two things should be the number of L3 misses per thousand instructions. I'm interested in represent per instruction, sorry. If I'm interested in representing that per thousand instruction, I have to multiply that value by 1000 to have numer numerical values which are somewhat uh, easier to read. And then I have, if I look at the semantic module, I will I'll show you how to do it. But first I try to look at the semantic module, how the function of time is built. And then what I see is that I have, you know, which tells me is that the, this configuration file was saved in basic mode, which only gives me access to a few of the possible setups. And in this case, there are setups that have to do essentially with the, with the coloring, the control of the coloring of the window. Okay, so I, if I change it, I change the coloring of the window. If I put here uh, 50 or 100, uh, let's say 60, for example, I'm changing the coloring of the window. And, and so this, for example, this area is beyond 60 L3 cache misses per thousand instructions. But this is all that the basic mode lets me change. Of course, I can always go to the full mode and we'll have access to all the parameters to set up this configuration. And among other things, the important thing here is this semantic module, how it is done. And what it says is, yes, it's the division of two windows, which we see we see here, but it's actually applying a factor of 1,000 to get the number of uh, misses per, per kilo instruction. So this is how you can combine different basic functions with basic uh, function uh, basic windows with basic functions of time probably we might want to know how do i build this function of time for example of l3 misses in a given interval let me zoom a little bit into let's say maybe just only one thread how do i or maybe a couple of threads uh, what i have in the trace are the events and the i can visualize the events and they are punctual things happening at, at specific points in time. And I can zoom maybe a little bit more. And you see that they, some of them may be far away from each other. Some of them may be too close from each other. It depends on when you do the MPI calls. This is when you, the extra package reads the hardware counters. Actually, I can copy and paste the fault here. And, and this is what we have here. We have two MPI calls. And this is where the hardware counters were read. How is this function of time for L3 misses in this interval built or in this interval? The value is the mechanism is specified here. And essentially what we have is 
basic operations, basic ways of building functions of time. And this is a typical one that you would use for uh, hardware control related metrics, which tells Paraver to go look for the next event. So if I am here, what is the value of the function I should be using here? I have to go to the next event. I have to look what is the associated value to that event. Let me try to display the events. I have to see the associated value to that event. And then this is the value that I will return for this interval. For this interval, I will return the value of this event. For this interval, I will return the value of the interval of the event at the end of the interval. This is a reasonable way of building the functions of time because when reading hardware counters, you have the information about in the number of instructions executed in an interval or the number of cache misses, you have that information at the end of the interval. But if you look at the MPI call, there's something similar. You also have the events. And of course, these events are, let me look at the full, these events are of a different type than the ones used for the for the ones in the L3 misses. For L3 misses, we were using at this event. And you have, I think I've looked at it, you have the table of all possible events here. For cache misses, we have to look at, uh, for sorry, for L1, uh, MPI calls, we have to look at the different set of events. In this case, actually, M extra uses uh, different types for point-to-point uh, -point collective calls and some others. So we have selecting, we are interested in all MPI calls, so we select all the whole range of event types used for MPI calls, and that's what we see here. But in this case, Xtry has the information of which is the call that I am entering, that information is available at the beginning, at the entry of the call. So in this case, that information is encoded in this let me look at the value. It's encoded in the in the event at the entry. And if I look at the non-numerical values encoded by 50 billion one, which is the event for the MPI calls, but the value three, value three, which happens to correspond to MPI ISENT. So that information is available at the beginning. What is the information that Xtrai puts at the end for these MPI calls? It, it puts an information which is same type, the 50 million one, but puts a value zero. In this case, zero has a little bit also a special meaning that is getting out of whatever MPI call it was. And and how do we build the function of time? The function of time has been for every point in time we look at the last of the previous and, and the previous event. So if I want to know what's the value of the function here, I look at these previous events and we saw that it was zero. If I want to know what's the value of the function here, I look at the previous event and we saw that it was a value of three. So this is the way how Paraver builds these basic functions of time. In, for example, as we said, for example, cache misses, for example, MPI calls. And there's a whole bunch, depends on how the, extra, the instrumentation package encodes the information, there's a whole bunch of uh, ways of reporting metrics. For example, an interesting, potentially interesting one is if I clone this window, let me zoom a little bit less. If I clone this window, maybe a potential way of reporting a function of time for is the interval between events. So it's actually telling me how far is each event from the next one. I can do this. In this case, of course, the, fun the the rendering, the appropriate rendering, because this can be um, um, has a very large dynamic range, is a gradient, and I can fit the gradient. And this function of time is actually the distance between MPI entries, entry and exit events. We drop this window and, and let us do let us look at some other windows that we can have. So we saw how to compute basic basic functions of time, either for hardware controls, for example, or for MPI calls. We saw how to derive from some of these basic functions and more elaborated derived functions of time. Let's see what we have here. We have, for example, IPC. And we have not IPC, but we have useful IPC. What is this? We can have a proper IPC, which is this one, which is actually dividing instructions by cycle in a similar manner and and this is something that will be information that will be available everywhere in the computation phases but also in the mpi 
within the MPI calls, but I'm not really often, I'm not really that interested on the behavior inside MPI. So I want to mask that out. How do I do it? I can have, this is another type of basic function, which is useful or not. Is zero if I am inside MPI, one if I am outside MPI. By multiplying these two windows, what I get is the multiplication is a window, which is this one, uh, sorry, this one, which actually what we see, what it has is, in the regions where I'm doing useful computation, it has the useful IPC. In the regions outside, in the regions of, in the MPI regions, it has a zero. So this is a cleaner view of the computation performance, scalar computation performance inside my user level code. And if I do histograms or I do any other statistics, this, the, the, the metrics, the results will not be cluttered by IPC, for example, inside MPI, which happens to be sometimes very good because sometimes MPI does PC weighting and, and, and no cache misses, for example, so it has to, happens to be very good. So this being able to focus a, a metric on given specific aspects, I believe is an important, an important uh, uh, functionality. But let's say we would be, so how do we build this, this derived from, these when are loaded, I loaded them. So how do I build them if I were interested in one of those? And uh, let me say I have here one, which is L1 cash misses per thousand instructions. I have here L3 cash misses, which in reality means I have L1 cash misses and I have L3 cash misses. What if I'm interested in knowing how many L3 cash misses I, uh, the application does per, or the system does per, uh, L3 cache miss in this case. Can be I build a derived function out of these two? By I do that by dragging one of them on top of the other, and I can select the operation that I am going to use to combine them. There's a bunch of operations, but in this case I'm interested in the division, in, in dividing them to compute how many L1 cache misses are per L3 cache miss. I create the window, and I have here the values, which uh, are a little bit out of the range. I fit the range, and this is these are the values that uh, that I get for that window. In reality, the values are between 0.35, the minimum, and 1600 for for the maximum. Okay, so this is the way how we build these uh, functions of time. I may want, once I have built a given function of title combining, I may want to save it as a configuration file. Probably I'd better give it the name, which would be in this case, for example, L1 divided by, by L3 misses. This is the semantic of this function of time. And I can save it. And let me do it by saving that configuration. I can actually choose, and in this way you can save one or more of these. And in reality, I'm going to do one thing, which is I'm going to save L1 divided by L3. This is, I consider this is a relevant view and I, I decide to save it. I'm going to save it in my directory and I'm going to give it L1 per L3. Let's give it this name. The number of L1s per L3. Let me give it this name. I can totally get out of Paraver, for example, and tomorrow I can come back. I can load the Paraver configure trace file that the same one that I was using, or I can load any other trace file. I can load it. I'm, I'm doing it with the same one, but I could do it with any other trace file and I can load on it the the configuration file that I have just saved. And I have the information that I uh, I generated. It actually depends on L1 cache misses and on L3 cache misses. This is saving the configuration file in full mode. If I go to look at the, uh, the semantic module, I can really see for each of them, I can really see all the parameters that the setup of the filter, the setup of the semantic, I can see all of them. Let me do another thing now, which is how do I save a file 
but this time I'm going to save it and I'm going to save the three of them and I'm going to save them in basic mode what before saving uh, there is a menu which tells me for each of those windows which is the which are the parameters that determine the setup of the filter and the semantic that I want to be made visible to the programmer uh, for example a typical choice we use is for example this is the mean l1 divided by l3 I can put text that have a semantic meaning for me this is the max L1 divided by L3. I can do the same thing for the others. I could I could do, let me do it for example, for some reason I might be interested in using the max L3 misses. Let me you have only this one. So I can decide which of these all these parameters that are used in the building the the, the semantic function I want to save. I save this window and let me save it in the same directory and let me call it now like, give it the name you choose okay now i can load that configuration file that i saved and if i load that configuration file i get of course the same view but if i look at the setup of the filter i have only available as a basic user of this configuration file i have only available the mechanisms, the, the 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 parameters that control in this case are actually needed. The parameters that control the coloring gradient. So if I put a, a 160, for example, here, is what we see. It changes the coloring, the coloring scale. You can you can put parameters that specify the coloring scale. You can put parameters that specify the semantic function. Is is you have a complete flexibility flexibility for that what uh, else would i like to show about the way of building functions of time let me uh, this this is one per thread right the l3 misses per thousand instruction one thing which we have not really shown much is that these views if we go back to the full mode these views are represented one row per thread. That's not on the only option. You can represent only one row for the for every process, for every MPI process, or you can represent only one row for the whole application. Let me do it here. And now I'm representing only one row for the whole application. What is this? function of time representing let me fit the scale what is function this function of time representing this function of time is an aggregate in the vertical dimension of the original of all the functions one per thread okay and what uh, type of aggregate I also have the possibility of determining for example is at the level of task is adding all the semantic functions of its constituent threads in this case, because we had only one thread per task, one thread per process, we have only one. At the level of application, is adding all the constituent, uh, all the constituent uh, semantic functions for the corresponding tasks inside this application. In this case, we did have several of those, 48 in this case. So this is adding the 48 functions of time. So the result of this is an addition of the functions of time in all the individual threads it's up to the specific type of metric that was displayed by this by this uh, function of time whether that really makes sense or that really does not make sense for example in this case adding the ratio between uh, add, adding the the ratios probably does not really make a lot of sense but probably something like averaging and there should be something like an average this would probably make sense, which would mean what is the average ratio between L1 and L3 across all different threads. The scale is very low, we out of range, we can fit it, and this is the average value. Whether adding or not across multiple threads has sense, meaning it's always functions of time, it, the, the tool will always do the addition, will always report something, but 
you can really imagine that for example if, if I have an MPI calls view if this this here the function of time is the identifier of the MPI calls I can certainly do the function of time at the level of application and I can certainly um, sorry Uh, I can certainly what I oh, know I can so I was actually selecting thread uh, thread zero I, I can certainly do the addition okay and I am adding the individual MPI call IDs does that have any meaning well adding MPI call IDs an MPI, say if an MPI I send was three and an MPI I receive uh, was two, and the result, uh, what, five is probably the identifier of an MPI weight something. So it's, it's, it doesn't really make sense. But there might be other ways of combining that might make sense. For example, what is the mode? What is the most frequent? What is the most frequent MPI call being done across all processors? And you have this region where you have, when you see the, the mode across all processors and this might have some semantic information. The point I was just willing to make is uh, you have the mechanism, the mechanism to aggregate in the uh, or across all threads into a single number per application or a single number per MPI process. You have a whole bunch of functions that you can use to do this aggregation but, uh, but you have to be a little bit careful on which would they use because whether they may they make make sense or may not make sense for example the average of the MPI call IDs does not make sense so the idea is the the mechanism is extremely flexible extremely powerful but uh, you it has to be used uh, with, with understanding what is it that you are adding or operating and, but the result, the important thing is that once you have done it, if you once you are happy with your result, you understand it, you see that this displaying the type of information that you really want, you can always save it in a configuration file as we have shown, and it can be loaded later without much concern. Of course, if you receive configuration files from somebody else uh, and you don't understand, they they seem to you it seems to you that they display something which is not what you would expect. You can always do this looking at the at the full mode and looking at the at the semantic module doing kind of a reverse engineering of how that function of time was uh, generated. With this, I will finalize this uh, phase of basic uh, functions of time, and uh, probably I refer you to other more elaborated uh, mechanisms of function of constructing functions of time when you have uh, MPI communications, when you have interaction between multiple threads and uh, the kind of analysis that you can use to drill down more in the, in the behavior of the, of the communication and communication patterns themselves. Thank you very much.